Hello, brothers and sisters and CCC. Hope you guys are doing well. Welcome to this devotional. Um, our text for today will be taken from Romans chapter 13, and I think it addresses uh, some of the issues that are currently going on in our society uh, from a Christian perspective of how we ought to live in times like this. And so before we get into it, let me pray for us, and then we'll get into our text. Father, thank you that you are the God, Lord, of the sacred and the civil realm. Thank you, Father, that uh, you call us, O oh Lord, uh, to live as obedient Christians, even in the worst of times. We pray, Lord, that you would grant us wisdom and understanding, Lord, to be able to live out the Christian faith in a world that is in utter chaos. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy in Jesus Christ, Lord, that has redeemed us and will one day set us free uh, from the bondage and consequences of sin. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So in context, um, our passage today is Romans chapter 13. And in context, uh, the, this passage here, Paul is trying to teach us about living our lives with submission to God as Christians. And in, in chapter 12, he talks about not seeking vengeance uh, on our own, but entrusting vengeance to the Lord. And so one of the ways in which we, we can submit to God is by entrusting ourselves to his vengeance, that the Lord will seek out vengeance for us. We don't have to do that on our, on our own personal strength, but to trust the Lord that he will avenge us and whatever injustice we face here um, in this world. And so our text today begins then in chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. We'll look at today. Chapter 13, verse 1. Let every person be subject to authority, to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear? of the one who is in authority, then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all who is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, and revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. Now, this passage is saying a lot here today, and I don't think we'll be able to get through the entire passage uh, in its entirety and talk about everything. But what I do want to address is I want to look at this passage from three pers uh, at three points. The establishment of government authority in verse 1, the consequences of resisting government authority in verses 2 and 3, and the purpose of government authority in verse 4. And then I want to look at some practical implications for us as believers. But first, the establishment of government authority. Verse 1 says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Now, this verse immediately brings to mind uh, authorities, government authorities that are secular and not Christian. Paul here is talking to Christians, but he's saying, in general, let everyone be subject to governing authorities because they have been instituted by God. Now, when did God institute government authority. Well, I think Paul here is hearkening us back to the language of the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 9, uh, when God talked to Noah in the covenant of common grace, and he required uh, for the blood of man that man's blood would be shed because man was created in his image. And so how would God do that? Let me read that, read the verse for us, and maybe we can get a better idea of what Paul is talking about here. Here in Genesis chapter 9 in God's covenant with Noah, he says here, 
And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it. And from man, from his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Now, one of the questions you would ask uh, Paul here is, how can God carry out in his covenant with Noah this requirement of man's blood being shed by another man? Well, I think Paul gives us the answer here in, in chapter 13. It's by government institutions, right? God has established governments to carry out his vengeance against evildoers. I think that's very obvious. So God works in providence in human history to establish governments that carry out his justice against those who violate his laws. Now, I don't know how he does that. Uh, somewhat mysterious in the way that he carries that out but I think uh, you know it's it's uh, sufficient to say that uh, government authorities exist because sin exists right if sin did not exist we wouldn't need governing authorities but we need governing authorities to restrain sins so in his common grace with Noah one of the ways that God uses to restrain sin is by instituting government authorities. And it doesn't matter if it's an evil government, it's an, if it's an evil form of government. That government has been established by God. And generally speaking, that government will pass and fight for good laws. Uh, and that's what Paul is telling us here. And so God himself establishes all authority, every authority, parental authority. Uh, federal authority, government authority, national authority, every single uh, office of authority in the world God himself has established. And as Christians, we're to be subject to that, whether it's uh, employees, uh, taxes, whatever. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll see a little bit of that as we get into the text a little bit more. So the establishment of government authority in verse 1. The consequences of resistance to government authority in verses 2 and 3. Let me read that for us. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority, Paul says? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. You see that? Uh, no matter what authority. Now, Paul is writing in a time uh, that uh, of where the Roman Emperor Nero was reigning. He was not under good authority. And therefore, it's a shocking to the Christians that he wrote that he would be telling them to be subject to the authority of the Roman emperors, who were often very wicked in their treatment of Christians. But Paul here is indeed saying just that, to be subject to these authorities. They were established by God. Emperor Nero was the emperor because God appointed him and gave him that position. In the Old Testament, Pharaoh was Pharaoh because God appointed him uh, to that position of authority. Now, is there any time that we must disobey authority? I think, of course, the Bible speaks to that as well. Is there ever a time that we can disobey authority, even though Paul is telling us here to be subject for the most part? Yes, there is. Remember the time uh, in the Old Testament when the Hebrew midwives were commanded by Pharaoh himself, the person that God put in authority, to put to death the male children in Israel. And what did the Hebrew midwives do? They disobeyed Pharaoh's order. They even lied to him. That's a whole other uh, ethical dilemma uh, that we can talk about later. But they even lied to Pharaoh and told him that the babies were born too fast uh, and they weren't able to kill them. So there you had... An explicit command of God against murder uh, that uh, was violated by the Hebrew midwives because uh, Pharaoh was asking them to do something that God commanded explicitly for them not to do. And so they disobeyed the authority. So we do, uh, if we're ever told to stop preaching the gospel or to do something immoral like taking lives, there we have the uh, command from God, the direct command to disobey um the authorities. But for the most part, Christians are to seek peace and to live in authority to those who are in authority over us. Okay, and so the purpose of government authority in verse 4, the purpose of government authority is government authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. He doesn't bear the sword in vain. Now, 
this brings up the whole idea and notion of capital punishment. Capital punishment was established by God uh, for evildoers. For those who were unrepentant, it was in the Old Testament. They were to be taken outside the city and stoned. In the New Testament here, Paul is affirming uh, uh, the, that God gives a sword to government. That one of government responsibilities is to put to death evildoers. You do not butter bread with a sword. You put people to death. And so generally speaking, the Bible is pro-capital punishment. I think that's clear in both testaments. Um, some practical implications. I know that we're getting into a, a lot of time here, but some practical implications for us as Christians uh, is we can find in verses 5 through 7. We are to obey government, as Paul says, for conscience sake in verse 5. Our conscience before God, knowing that God has established government authority, right? Knowing that God has established these institutions for our good, Paul says, to violate them would be to sin against God and violate our very consciences, right, before God. And so, therefore, as Christians, we're to live in obedience to these government authorities uh, just for conscience sake. Because we know that to violate them is to violate the very uh, law of God, is to violate and sin against God to violate the very institutions that he has established. And so some practical implications, Paul says, pay taxes, uh, pay revenue to whom revenue is owed. And um, revenue is another word for customs or taxable goods. If you have a business and you uh, owe salaries to your employees, uh, pay their salaries. Uh, if you owe money to government institutions like uh, student loans and things like that, pay those. Pay respect to whom respect is due and honor to whom honor is due. And um, I just want to close by, by talking a little bit about some of the riots that's going on in America. Um, clearly, in those instances, people are not being subject to authority. Now, these people aren't all Christian. Uh, perhaps they're a very small minority of people. But that uh, the riots and the looting is very contrary to what the Bible teaches us to do as Christians. I think as Christians, it's very clear that we should not be involved in lawlessness. Uh, is there is it ever right to riot or loot? I think that there are places for peaceful protests. But as Christians, we are to be subject, and we're to be subject for the gospel's sake, right? Because the gospel trumps all social injustice. Uh, because the gospel addresses the injustice of sin against God. And that's the greatest injustice in the world, right? Sin against God is the greatest injustice in the world. And only Jesus Christ, his life, death, and resurrection rectifies that injustice. And so that's what needs to be preached above social justice. Not to minimize social justice or to, uh, you know, but we don't want to elevate it above the message of the gospel. I know I've rambled on for quite some time. Again, if you have questions, you can call me uh, personally or WhatsApp me. I'm uh, always free to talk to you guys. So sorry that this is a long message today, but there's a lot going on and I hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you so much.